Today, after almost a century of trying, today, after over a year of debate, today, after all the votes have been tallied, health insurance reform becomes law in the United States of America. Welcome to episode 95 of the Juice Box Podcast. This episode is sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the G5 Mobile Continuous Glucose Monitoring System, and by Omnipod, the world's only tubeless insulin pump. With everything going on in the world today revolving around appealing the Affordable Care Act, I thought it would be interesting to talk to a few people who have type 1 diabetes who count on the Affordable Care Act for their health care. I also speak with someone who has type 1 diabetes who tried to just change jobs and lost his coverage because of a pre-existing condition. When I began looking for people who wanted to come on and talk about this subject, I was reminded by one of the listeners of the, of the podcast, Clayton, and Clayton, thank you very much. Clayton wrote me a note and he said, I just want to send you a quick note. He said, quote, every single one of us is affected by the ACA, even if we have employer plans, coverage of pre-existing conditions, the prevention of lifetime limits, making it unlawful to charge more for premiums if one has a chronic condition, access to women's and preventative health, and on and on and on are protected by the ACA. So in this episode, you're going to hear from three different adults living with type 1 diabetes. Each of them has a unique story that I think highlights the importance of the Affordable Care Act. Remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. So in 2007, I decided I was living in Southern California, um, just finished, well, finished college down there in LA, but my parents were living in Phoenix. So I decided to job search closer to them. Even though Mike's story takes place before the Affordable Care Act, it is a fantastic illustration of the need for protection for people with a pre-existing condition. And I found a job out in Phoenix. And what I didn't understand at the time, I, w I already had been diagnosed with diabetes and was living with diabetes, but I didn't understand that the, a gap in health insurance would mean that diabetes became a pre-existing condition. That term was new to me. Um, I was still just trying to wrap my head around like what insulin did and what an insulin pump was. Like there was so much learning going on. The pre-existing condition was really far on the list of things I needed to learn, um, I thought. Um, so uh, when I finally got to Phoenix, I uh, found employment. That employment um, didn't allow me to have health insurance for three months, which is pretty typical, like a 90-day waiting period or something like that. But once I w finally got health insurance, um, I found out that diabetes was actually a pre-existing condition and wouldn't be covered by my new health plan for six months after that. So um, that meant I could go to the doctor. I could um, talk about, you know, my cholesterol levels or um, a rash or <laughs> like anything else, but not diabetes. If I talked about diabetes, it wouldn't be paid for by the insurance company, Um Medicine, insulin wouldn't be covered by the insurance company. Blood draws that were checking my A1C levels, that would not be covered by insurance. So everything other than diabetes was covered. So um, when I was waiting out this pre-existing condition clause, I started going online. That's actually where I found 2Diabetes, um, which is run by the Diabetes Hands Foundation and now is my employer. Um, so I, I met good people um, through kind of this, community that I found, I found people like Scott and, you know, just all these great people. So there is a silver lining there. But um, I was also, you know, talking to people about how to stretch insulin so that I use less. Um, I was talking about like reusing syringes and just you know, whatever I could, if there was like tea I could use to make me use less insulin or use less insulin, you know, I was doing whatever I could. Um, so like you're in your early 20s, you've just finished college. Yeah. And, and, well, wow, that's crazy. So it's funny. Yeah. I didn't even understand that about pre existing. I thought there were, I thought they could just completely shut you down and there, there'd be some insurance companies that wouldn't pick you up at all if you had a pre existing condition. But they took you, but they gave you this six month basically ban on diabetes. Right. It was, it was through my new employer. So it was an employer um, paid plan. So this is, is it not that 
atypical. It's pretty normal. Okay. Um, with my new employer, I got insurance without a problem, but I just had to wait an extra six months. So everyone that worked around me, they got everything covered. Um, they had safeguards in place. But for me and my insulin, I didn't. I had to take a risk so that the insurance company could save some cash. And that's, I mean, because in the end, it doesn't make, I mean, from a reasonable outside perspective, it doesn't make any sense to make you just like six months. Like, what does that mean? You, you know, like six months worth of syringes and insulin? Like that, that's it. They just saved on that. Could the doctor even write you a script? Well, we, the doctor wasn't allowed to even talk about diabetes. Of course, wow. any sane doctor, when I walked into their office and explained this story to them, they did ask what was going on and stuff. Um, but. Uh, yeah, the, they didn't write me prescriptions if unless I asked for it. So uh, because I was paying cash for everything, I was I actually in the beginning tried to get samples from my my doctor as much as I could. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't last forever. And um, during the kind of the last month of my pre existing condition clause. Um, I had to make a, just a stupid decision. I had a car payment that was due that I kind of was like kicking down the road and was like always late on cause I was paying, uh, hundreds of dollars for a vial of insulin. Um, so, and I wasn't making tons of money. I was young and you know, that was just my reality. And so that last month, uh, the timing, everything just caught up with me and I had to decide if I wanted to pay for my car payment or if I wanted to refill an insulin prescription, mm-hmm. which is, I think in retrospect, this. I made a stupid choice. Like, of course I should have bought insulin. Somebody, I could have asked somebody for help and just pride gets in the way. And so I didn't ask for help and I ended up making a stupid choice. I do want to ask you about that. So that, that was a reality in that situation. You did think there are probably people who could help me, but I guess striking out on your own, having your first job, you weren't looking to go back to your parents and say, Hey, I've already fallen on my face. Right. So I need help. That actually came into your mind. No, you know what? It came into my mind in retrospect. I mean, sitting in the hospital bed, um, spoiler alert, I eventually go DKA, but uh, spitting, sitting in the hospital bed, my mom comes to visit, my sister comes to visit, and my sister kicks me. You know, she's like, you should have just asked me. Like, I could have given you money. Right. And that all makes sense in retrospect, but when you're sitting there, you know, taking a gamble, you're not really worried about the consequences of what would happen if you don't win the bet. But you so. so you knew for sure if you didn't make the car payment, the car was disappearing. But it's still see, I think it's sort of a an odd allegory for for health, right? Like you know, you always yeah. you always sort of think I'll be okay. Like this isn't going to be the one that does me, and I can, you know, I can have another cheeseburger. I'm not having a heart sure. attack today. Like you know, like well, that sort of thing. It's a hard, just a hard decision because in retrospect, they probably wouldn't have repoed the car for one really late car payment either. But I'm, I was new at car payments. I was new at diabetes. I was new at health insurance. Like, all of this is new to me, right? Yeah. And I'm just kind of forced to make these weird decisions that nobody taught me in school how to, you know, would you, should you pay your car payment or buy insulin? Like, that's not a decision that's ever, I've never tested before. So. Can you imagine that? Mikey has a car <laughs> and type 1 diabetes. His job won't pay for his... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, how many bags of apples? And <laughs> yeah, I guess so that's not something to get taught. What's super ironic, Scott, is literally days. I think it was like seven days, maybe, before my insurance plan would begin to cover the cost of insulin, making it instead of you know a thousand bucks, it was closer to you know thirty or whatever the copay was. Days before that, I was hospitalized for DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, which. I thought I was having the flu, and I'm, diabetes was so new to me, so I didn't even really kind of see the symptoms. Like, I can't keep food down, and my blood sugar's really high. Like, those two things are probably related. That was new to me, too. And um, so I was hospitalized for four days, um, right before my insurance plan started covering diabetes stuff. And um, the, it's so ironic, too, because the hospital visit cost me close to 15 grand, which haunted me and 15 grand could have bought me a brand new car. So I could have, <laughs> you could have let the car go, took care of your rent. You yeah. Know, so buy- <laughs> yeah. But, and then I was paying these like payments for months, you know, diabetes is covered by insurance. Things are getting back on track, but then I'm still haunted by this dumb pre-existing condition clause because I'm paying for the hospital visit that it 
um, eventually caused, you know? So it, it was around for a while. Yeah, it's a bummer. I, I think if, if people listening really wrap their heads around this for a second, you still have to remember, you're talking about you, Mike, who, who's a person who has a job, you have insurance, you have an income coming in, and, and this is still this impactful on, on, right. on your life. This, this pre-existing conditions clause is still that impactful to you. I'm trying to imagine as you're talking for a person who's on a state-run health plan or, you know, does not have a, a fluid income, you know, that kind of thing. It, it, as frightening as it is for you, I would imagine it's magnified just, right. a, just a million times. And it's not something I can imagine, but it's something I worry about. So I have my, I have health insurance. Arden has health insurance. You know, I, I do believe we pay thousands of dollars a year in co-pays and things like that. But, you know, it, it obviously could be a lot worse. But you still look at, you know, you look at your kids and you think, wow, she's 12. You don't know who she's going to be when she grows up. Like, mm -hmm. is she going to kind of like trip out of the house when she's 18 like an artist and be like, hey, I'm going to bomb around for a little bit? Or is she going to be one of those kids who's like, I'm going off to college and I'm going to be this and I'll get a job doing that and it'll all be okay. You, you don't know. And, you, sure. don't, you know, you but don't even, wanna, go ahead. Even that more stable path that you talk about, like. She, when she finds a job, does she have to stay there forever because she's afraid of losing coverage? Like, that's not a good reality either. Right. Like, it, and that's the more stable route, you know? Like, I, I didn't do anything that risky. All I did was decide to move closer to my parents. Like, <laughs> people do that all the time and they don't die for it. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And so what you're saying is that basically is you could be put into a situation where relocating and changing jobs or, you know, or, or having a job that you absolutely detest or hate, or how about this? How about just you have a better opportunity around the corner and you'd like to take it, but if you take that opportunity, then there's a gap in your coverage and now you have a pre-existing condition all of a sudden. Right. Like me, me taking risks cost thousands of dollars more than somebody who doesn't have a chronic condition, and I think that's shameful. And I think that this conversation gets political very easily, but... I would guess most people listening to this are at least on the same page with that, that people with diabetes or chronic conditions shouldn't have to suffer more just because of that chronic condition when it comes to things like career or where they live or, you know, what they just do with their lives. I don't even like the, the part that jumps out at me that I don't even find to be that political. It's sort of obvious, right? That Companies are trying to make money. They put legislation in place. They're always looking for a spot where they can make a couple bucks back. And right. so at some point, someone just said, hey, how about when they change jobs, we don't have to cover the stuff that happened to them before we were with them. Even if it's just, you know, and I bet you at some point that got pushed for always. Like, you know, if mm -hmm. you show up to me with a hangnail and it's an ongoing treatment, <laughs> we're not paying for your hangnail treatment. If you get another one on another one, then, 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 then we'll take care of that toe, but not the first toe. And, and, sure. you know, and, and I, I, obviously someone must've come along at some point you're, you're hoping in, in government, but it's most likely a watchdog group who comes in and says, look, you can't do that. What about these people? Y you know? And then, okay, well, and then they negotiate it down to six months. And basically what you're saying is, is that whatever that cost is in that six months, the, the insurance company shifts it off of their ledger onto your ledger, except the, the truth is, is it something that costs you $1,000 cash doesn't cost them $1,000. You, you know what I mean? They're, they've got negotiated mm -hmm. deals with all kinds of in institutions for, for care, for medication, for devices. And so it's possible that five, six, ten times the actual negotiated cost is what comes back to you. Like that $15,000 hospital visit for you probably only would have cost your insurance company, you know, three or $4,000. Sure. Yeah. I do wonder if, like, if aliens came down to our planet and they understood a lot of things, but they didn't understand healthcare in the U.S., like, I think that they would be surprised that we, we are even talking, like, business and bottom line and company and all of that when it comes to, like, the health of the people. Yeah. Like, I don't really even understand why it's a, why are businessmen making decisions about me and my insulin? Right. I think that's it's weird. It, I don't know. It, it's, it, it is the, um, it's the spot where capitalism fails us. Like, like it, it really is that you, you know, you, it's, it's an American thing. Like you should, you can start a business and try to make a profit and that's a very American thing and there's nothing wrong with it, except it is weird when it comes down to health. And then the other side, the flip side of it is this, right? If, if there was not a incentive for that company to make money, 
would we be, where would we be in healthcare? Like, would we have any of these things or would those really smart people just go open up a different business? You know, I, I, I think about True. that a lot. Like, like my, like I've talked about it here all the time. My wife works in pharma. She's a really good student and a really bright person. And there's a certain amount of money she needs for her time. And so if a health related organization wasn't willing to pay her that, she would probably go somewhere else and work. Sure. And, and then what level of people would you have at that pharmaceutical company? Like, you know what I mean? Like right. It's, right, right, right. Yeah, it's such a I, weird. I understand a lot of that. And I think there is, there, that's a separate conversation. Maybe in, I mean, I work for a nonprofit organization and I, I fight that all the time that the people who work and run nonprofits should also get paid, you know, well. And I think that that makes sense that if you want talent, you have to pay for them to stay there. So I don't think the insurance companies maybe shouldn't make profit or pharmaceutical companies shouldn't, but just a, there should be maybe a limit or I don't know. It makes sense from a human. Listen, all these conversations from a human perspective, I side with everything you're saying every time, you, you know, like, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no way around it. It's, I mean, how much is enough for a pill or for, you know, a procedure or something like that? And then somebody's going to come along and tell you, well, listen, the institution that the doctor, you know, uh, did the procedure and has to make money. That was an anesthesiologist. There's a guy that mops the floor. There's somebody that keeps the, the lights working. And the doctor went to college, blah, blah, blah. And by the time you get done, you go, oh, all right, leave me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's such a, it's such an, and it comes from how it was built from the bottom up, which is why you hear people who, who come through and say, you know, healthcare as an example needs to be completely deconstructed and rebuilt. That really does seem to make the most sense because as much as I am completely on the side of, um, you know, what, you know, I guess what Republicans called Obamacare to try to make it sound um, dirty, um, you know, I, I am on the side of people getting coverage. You know, I think that if a person walks into a, a, an ER with a broken arm and doesn't have insurance, at some point that money gets charged back to the public somehow, right? Like it eventually hits us all the same way. I would, I would much rather have a few hundred dollars less a year in my pocket and have millions of people with the dignity available to them to walk into a, a doctor's office or, or a hospital and say, hey, my arm's broken. I'd like to get my arm set. You, you know, like I, I think that just benefits the world in a very human way. I don't understand arguing with that. Sure. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I have background noise. I'm sorry about no, that. No, that's fine. Are you uh, vacuuming? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I multitask, Scott. <laughs> I'm a very busy man. <laughs> you have no idea. When you asked me to sit down like this, I thought, I don't know if I can take the time. It's the day I was going to clean. So, <laughs> but no, um, we have construction yeah. going on at the home. So, oh, very sorry nice. about that. No, no, not at all. I mean, the fact that the dogs aren't barking is fascinating. I actually get emails sometimes. People asking if the dogs are okay. They haven't heard them in a few episodes. <laughs> like, I finally got the dogs to be quiet during this, and you're telling me you miss it. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm trying too hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now, you know, it, can you see any of these changes still affecting you? Like, I mean, if you switch jobs again, would you be right back in this boat again? Yeah, I mean, I am older, which luckily means I'm no longer, you know, surviving on top ramen and. That's a good thing. So I, I feel like I'm better equipped to handle them. I'm also, I think, smarter when it comes to diabetes. I know you can't skip insulin. <laughs> That's a lesson I learned the hard way, right? Right, right? Is, you know, trying to stretch out your insulin is not, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yes, it's possible that I could, you know, switch jobs or lose a job and then end up paying cash for everything and having a pre existing condition and struggling. But I think that I'm better equipped and, more connected with kind of the diabetes space, but um, it certainly could become a thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I see the same thing with my daughter. I feel fairly stable, but at the same time, you know, if my wife lost her job, it would at some point we'd get into a bad space. I don't have money saved for eternity, you know. So, right. um, it, it, it's you said something earlier, and I'm struggling to remember what it was, and it hit me so impactfully at the moment. Um, just the idea of like you shouldn't be restricted from living your life to have to, you know, like staying somewhere without, I don't know, staying somewhere because you're scared to lose something as basic as healthcare is, it seems frightening to me. It seems like there's all these people that could be stuck in these jobs where maybe they have better options or they're just miserable and don't have a better option, but want to get away from it or whatever it ends up being. 
and they just can't. They're frozen. It just yeah, seems it's like jail. a slippery slope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like, you, literally, it's my livelihood on the line. Like, that's a really difficult gamble to take. And I think leaving jobs and, I mean, the world has changed. People job hop all the time now. And it, it's kind of become, you know, part of the way we, you know, handle our careers. And it, it's just bizarre to say that someone living with a chronic condition can't do that because the other option is death. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Right? And we're not even talking about all the other. I mean, you know, endless amounts of illnesses. We're just talking about it around diabetes. But it's just, I mean, when you when you talked about not having insulin for six months and I thought, wow, you almost made it. Like, like I, that's right. how it struck me when you said just a few days before I was going to get insul- or insurance, you know, I, 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 I went to DK. I was like, oh, my God, he almost made it. It was like a bad movie. Like you were racing yeah. across the desert. Like you could see the oasis and it just, you know, it just, I don't know. I felt terrible for you. And at the same time, I kept wondering, like, how did you make it that far? You, you know, yeah, like, I don't like, know. <laughs> like, how did it no not happen idea. sooner, you know? Scott, uh, sometimes I had Lantis, sometimes I had Levamir, sometimes I had uh, Humalog, sometimes Novolog, and I just pieced together whatever I could do. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were plenty of times, too, where I was just injecting insulin and had no idea what my current blood sugar was. I just knew it was high, so who cares how much I'm, insulin I'm giving because it won't bring me that low. You know what I mean? Like, I was that was the life I was living. Always feeling crummy. Um, yeah, it was awful. Yeah, I think that is the other part of it that we don't talk about. Even when people, you know, are kind of accepting of elevated blood sugars as part of their norm, is that you, you know, this isn't just something you need to stay alive, but you're altered. You know, yeah. And, you, know, you know, we don't talk about that it's enough. Sure. When, you, when your blood sugar is high, like you are altered, you are living as a person who you aren't in reality. You, you know, your right. brain, your brain is operating differently because of the amount of sugar in your blood. And and you're not even authentically you in that moment. It's uh, it's terrible. You know, in a million yeah. different ways. But I appreciate you sharing the story. Yeah, I'm glad I could come on. I love the podcast, so it was nice to be able to join you. You didn't have to say that, but you said it exactly the way I wrote it down <laughs> for you. So thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Mike, I really appreciate this. Thanks so much. Yeah, nice talking to you, Scott. You too. And now a word from our sponsor, Dexcom. My daughter Arden is 12 years old, and she never sits still. Between school, softball, and running around with her friends, she is always doing something. But even with her busy schedule, keeping track of her glucose levels couldn't be simpler. The Dexcom Share and Follow features allow us to be alerted whenever Arden's blood glucose level leaves the range that we set. The sense of calm and fantastic blood glucose control that the Dexcom CGM system helps to bring into our lives is invaluable. So what are you waiting for? Go to www.dexcom.com forward slash juice box or click on the link in your show notes to find out more. That's dexcom.com forward slash juice box. Get started today. I'm Michelle. I am 26 years old, and I've been diabetic for a little over 20 years at this point. Um, Insurance was through my mother's plan until I aged off last May. So at that point, I had to get one of the marketplace plans because my job did not offer insurance through them. Okay. And so in in layman's terms, you're using the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? Yes. Okay. Yes, the Obamacare ACA marketplace. And so, and you have decent insurance through it now. Like, is it a step down from what you had with your mom? It's definitely a step down. They um, are a little bit more strict on test strips and um, copays and things like that. But it's I bought the deluxe package basically just because I knew that they would cover what I needed. Um, so I'm willing to pay for it if it will be a better option. And it's a, it's not to overuse the word here, but it is affordable too. Is it, is it commiserate to what you'd expect to pay if you had a, a job situation that was offering you insurance through them? Um, it's probably a little more expensive, but it is affordable. Um, thanks to my husband. Um, I prob I might not be able to afford it on my own, but I would get a subsidy if I was not married most likely. So. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so it's not – so for you, you're a working person who just had a job that's not going to offer you insurance. How about um, yep. how about pre-existing conditions? You came in with type 1 diabetes. Did they make you wait till you started treating yourself? No. No. They, there was no waiting period. It kicked in as soon as I made that first payment. Day one. So. Okay. Um, okay. So that's pretty fascinating because I think that even for me, you know, I, I – for you know what, let's just say it out loud. M- Michelle and I talked for a couple of minutes, and then the power went out here, and so now we're doing, <laughs> we're doing it again. So if I don't say that, it'll just all feel false to me as I'm talking to you. But, um, <laughs> but so you know, so I think the interesting thing here is, it, it, you know, honestly, is that even my understanding of what this is, and and I would imagine most people's is, you know, I don't have a full grasp of it, to be perfectly honest. You know, like yeah. It, it never even occurs to me as you're listening about it on the news or, you know, trying to understand it, you know, in real life that you'd be a gainfully employed person. Like I just thought, oh, if you're using, you know, Obamacare, you must, you know, not have a job or not have money. Yeah. I mean, every single person in my office is an Obamacare ACA participant and we're all gainfully employed. So it's it's definitely not the quote unquote freelancer slash unemployed person that I guess is stereotypically well, the stereotype, oh, the stereotype is really, it's strong, you know, because I've had conversations with other people and, and they right away, you know, I find that, I find that sometimes, you know, you either find kind people or you find people who believe that they've worked so hard and everyone should too, which, you know, I don't, I don't not believe that people shouldn't work for what they have, but sometimes there's that, that wall you throw up. Well, I have it cause I deserve it. They don't have it because they don't deserve it. And Right, you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? It's an odd way of thinking, in my opinion. I, I think, you know, like I said to you before, I, I'm just happy that more people have health insurance. And exactly. You know, and I don't. I think it's, it's just so crazy that people are not happy about that. It's an oddity. I, I, I know. I, pay, <laughs> I know. I pay more since this has gone into effect. And I, right. I, I want to really. And say that's it. what a lot of people say is bad about it because the people who had the families that had insurance before they do pay more now, and that. That sucks, but there's 20 million plus Americans who have insurance now. At some point, you need to, I, I think, feel good about that or understand that the the system itself is obviously the problem. I don't know that this yeah. is the right fix. I don't probably think that it is, but it, at the same time, we can't all sit around while you have catastrophic health issues um, and wait for the you know po- politicians and insurance companies to come up with the exact right fix for this because that's really genuinely never going to happen. You- never. It will. No. Yeah. You can you can make as many amendments as you want, and you're not going to find the perfect fix for every single individual in America. But I mean, you have to you have to weigh the options. Yeah. So you start with something, and then you better it as you go. Um, yeah. But but so. I, I guess I'd have to ask you, so what, it's just, you know, I, I thought we were going to have to be more specific, but we're not. You have medical insurance through this. So what would it mean to you if, 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 the, if the Affordable Care Act just gets repealed and there's no replacement for it, what's, a real, what's your real world situation? What happens to you immediately? Um, so, well, that's just terrifying. Let me just take a minute. <laughs> um. I would lose access to insulin because it's basically unaffordable past a certain point. Um, I think ins- or insulin is like $300 per bottle without coverage. Um, so that's terrifying. And I know that there are ways through um, like the manufacturers that you might get help somehow. Um, I need to look into that. But I know that's an option. I would say um, this. I would think that if you are gainfully employed, you probably make too much money for some of those options. That's true. Yeah. And, yeah. And so um, if you don't mind, and if you do mind, don't say, but do you know what you're out of pocket for your insurance is every month for, for the ACA? What do you pay for it? Even I roughly? pay $496. $496 a month comes out of your check, pays for this. Um, yep. And, but how many vi- well, I make a payment to Blue Cross Blue Shield, but yeah. I understand. Okay. So how many um, vials of insulin do you use in 30 days? Um, Two. Two. Okay. And do you have, One and a, have to. Do you have an insulin pump or do you do injections? Uh, I've got a pump. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any idea what the, what the out-of-pocket costs for the pump supplies would be? Do you think you'd have to go um, to injections if you lost your insurance? Yes, I would. Okay. Um, I don't have a CGM now because I don't, 
insurance won't cover enough of it to make it affordable. Okay. Um, Did you have one prior? My, no, no, I haven't. I want one desperately, but um, it, insurance just won't cover enough of it to make it feasible. Okay. Um, but my out of pocket for three months supply of pump supplies was roughly one fifty, and insurance covered maybe six hundred ish. I don't have exact numbers, no, but that's sure. roughly what I remember from my last go round. So, so if you lose your insurance, your out of pocket would would triple. Pretty much. Yeah, and could you do that? Um, maybe for a while, but that's yeah. So, would it cut into your savings? Most likely, yeah. yeah. I mean, after we probably we could cover it for maybe I don't know if we skimped maybe six months. Um, but after that, it would fall off the ledge. Yeah. And you would be talking to my parents and stuff. Hi hi, mom. It's me again. And so, and so to keep, to keep clear about that, right. You are, you're a healthy, hardworking 26 year old person who's married. There's two people bringing an income into your house. If you, if you lost your Obamacare about six months from now, you would, you would lose the ability to take care of yourself. And what that means more specifically is to stay alive. Because that insulin keeps yeah. you alive every day. Okay. Yes. All right. That is horrifying. And we do have to take a <laughs> for that. Um, and another thing is I have complications and I have to have uh, retinopathy treatment. Okay. So those are thousands of dollars per visit. And that would be out of the question if I did not have coverage. So I would also lose my vision pretty quickly, most likely. Uh, so as a result of your type 1 diabetes, from which you did nothing to get... Um, you have, yeah. you have issues, you have issues with your eyes that are very expensive to maintain that mm-hmm. those, those retinopathy issues. These are maintenance visits. The, they're focused on slowing the progression of the disease in your eye. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like you're going to get it fixed. No one's going to find a secret switch to flip it off and to go, Oh, look, that's all. Yeah, no. right. There's no reversing it at this point. It's just, um, basically trying to repair the damage and hopefully making it um, slow down. Right. And and if you stop seeking those treatments, do you have a feeling for how much, how much that would accelerate the, the disease in your eye? Well, fortunately at this point I have very good control because I've had such good access to test strips and things like that. Um, so I'm very well controlled right now. And I think that would help. Um, slow down any more progression of the retinopathy, but I don't know. So hopefully I could have another year, two years maybe. But again, that it's completely dependent on just what's going on in my body. And I have no idea. Right, and where you're able to keep your blood sugar with the, yeah, ins- yeah. With the insulin that you're getting through your Obamacare. Yes. Right. <laughs> Which, exactly. Okay. So I almost feel like we don't have to talk anymore, but let's beat the bush a little harder for people who maybe didn't understand the first time or didn't feel it. Uh, <laughs> it didn't feel it hard hard enough. Um, <laughs> do you know? What I mean? It's just it's you know to go off on a on a side note on a bit of a tangent for a second. Um, I just think that this is a specific situation where I'm sure someone could come on and argue that Obamacare wasn't done well or whatever, and then I might say back that, you know, insurance companies have lobbyists and that's why these things don't get written the way they're supposed to and and that this fight's going to continue on forever. But I think that once you have all those procedural arguments, what you come down to is, in the meantime, what should sick people do? Should they just sit there and wait for you to fix it? Uh, you, you know, should they, you know, should they yeah. get a fourth job? Should they, like, you know, like exactly what is it that you should do just to, to maintain a level of health? Yeah, I mean, should you just eat vegetables the whole time and exercise constantly to try to keep your blood sugar in range? Because that's not, that won't work, right. you know? I that, mean, that's how they treated type 1 diabetes in 1920. They, you know, stop, yeah, stop taking they, yeah. carbs and go run around in your backyard. And, yeah, no. and that didn't work out very well. Uh, for, no, you know, for no. most people <laughs> and it, it just it's striking to me that that you're it's funny because I, I just put the kind of call out like anybody who has this that's willing to talk about it like get in touch and you know emails you don't know anything about somebody going back and forth and when you popped up and you're in your mid 20s and you're you're working and you know I just thought wow like this isn't what I expected 
it, it, <laughs> well, I'm it, glad. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's a, a happy surprise for this conversation because I guess I expected you to fall more into a stereotype. And, yeah. and, and I'm really hopeful that people hearing this will recognize that it's very simple to sit in your house, hear about a problem through the news or through the internet or however it is you take in your information. You get a slanted view of it from a couple of different sides. And then right. you, you paint a picture in your head. And this is what it is to you from now on, right? You know, it's yeah. just, you know, the people who listen to the podcast who don't know what I look like, but in their mind, they have an idea. They, they, know, <laughs> they know what I think I look like, right? And they're probably 100% yeah. wrong. I'm much handsomer. <laughs> but, but it's, it's just, it's, it, they're, they're probably wrong. We build this kind of narrative in our own heads, and then that becomes the truth, like forevermore and going forward. And yeah, I mean, unless it's impacting you directly, then you really, you have your biases based on the media. And if you're not exposed to it directly, then you, that never really changes, right. you know? And it also can be this, you know, it, it could be very simple. Like, you know, I do know th there's plenty of people who have a very, I think it's a very simple concept. It's, I work really hard, this is my money, and every time I pay more in taxes for somebody else, that is less for me. And it's completely valid and 100% true. But then you're angry about that, or it hurt you somehow, and so you need to turn that into something that you can feel good about your anger, right? Like, so it must be right. this, it must be this person who wakes up at three o'clock in the afternoon, Michelle, you must then start smoking your meth right away and then, <laughs> and then get your free, meth and get, heroin oh, and all, all the that, drugs. right? Lay around the street and then get your free health care exactly, that yeah. I'm paying for. And then, <laughs> and you don't even deserve to be alive. You, 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 you know, like, right, like, I should just die. I mean, just let me just die on the street. And when I paint that narrative in my head, then it makes it okay for me to be angry about it. And and for me, you know, I, I see that money go out the door too, and it's it's distressing to me as well. I have kids and my own issues and struggles and things, and you know, that from 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 very first world problems. Like I really would like to replace the rug in my living room, and I can't afford to, <laughs> you, you know to to more specific problems. Like my daughter also has type one diabetes, and we have you know thousands of dollars of outlay of cash that comes out every year because of that. Um, yeah. I would like to have more of my money too. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't everyone? But right, exactly. <laughs> but then but I, I'm okay with helping other people. I mean, that makes me feel better at the end of the day. I'm looking at this little picture of you. Um, it you know that pops up on Skype, and we're not looking at a video of each other. And like, I feel happy that that the money that is leaving my taxes is helping you get good insurance. Like, it just seems reasonable to me. Doesn't it? I agree. I mean. I would I would give more money if it means more people could have access to quality care. I, I definitely think that. And I, I actually try to consider too, everyone's paying taxes within reason. Most people are paying taxes. And I'm benefiting from something. So there's someone somewhere, Michelle, paying taxes that fix a road in the state I live in, but they don't drive. And so here yeah. I here I am driving along on their money. You, you, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. And there's the nice lady across the street from me who's been retired for 30 years and her kids are... 50 years old or whatever it is. She, she, she's like a million years old. So I, it's hard for me to tell exactly, but <laughs> she's still paying taxes, right? To pay for my schools. And I send my kids to the school. She's receiving no benefit from that. But then I would argue maybe she is, maybe she's still living in a town where kids are getting educated and maybe their education is keeping them as, you know, uh, more balanced, better citizens. Y you know, maybe she yeah. has to live in a more civil place because the children in her town are civil. Maybe that's why they're not throwing a bottle through her window at night <laughs> or something like that. You're still getting something, yeah. right? And she probably went to the public school as well. So. Exactly. It's a big thing. You know, and, and before, yeah. before this existed, like we mused a little bit, like what would you do if you lost it? You know, and you, you said, well, I, I guess I'd go to my mom. But then take it a step further. What if your mom didn't exist? What would you do then? You know, and then eventually, yeah. you know, that's terrifying, right? You'd end up in the ER. You you would not use insulin, for which would cost taxpayers more money. Exactly my point. <laughs> and so, if it's going to come out of pocket for me and other people who you know are not having trouble buying their insurance in other means, I would rather it come out before Michelle goes blind than yeah. after she does. Because it will cost more after Michelle goes blind. I don't know why this isn't common sense, Michelle. But you're I don't either, right. Scott. And, I don't so, know. And, and again, go back to the thing. You could be sitting on the other side of this right now, fuming at me and you, right? Going like, they don't <laughs> understand how poorly this bill is written and everything. 
Meanwhile, I don't know a lot of people who went to college to, you know, be proficient in reading healthcare acts and understanding exactly how they work and everything. But if you're one of those people, come on the podcast, connect to me, first of all. But, you know, the, the understanding here for me is that in the moment, it's not, it's not good, but it's better. And I, it, it brings up to me like a very simple saying that I, I, that I, I'm reminded of in a different, different walks of life all the time. And I think that the, the saying is, and if I might be getting a little wrong, but you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is by no means a perfect problem or a perfect program because I have weekly frustrations trying to get enough test strips or approval for more pump supplies or something that I need to have a better quality of life. And I have to fight for that, but I would much rather have to fight for that versus just having to worry and struggle and scrape money together to come up with a way to pay for it out of pocket. So it's by no means perfect whatsoever, but it is better than nothing. And, and yeah, and you're not at home sitting on a giant cloud of my money and other people's money going, ha 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 ha. And you, you know, <laughs> no. like, I've tricked them all. You, you, you're still paying, yeah. <laughs> you're, still, you're paying close to $500 a month for a single person. You know, I'm thinking mm-hmm. of what I pay for a family of four. 500's in line with what everyone else pays, I think. I don't, I don't think it's, it's not cheap for you. And, and maybe that is the argument that, you know, well, people with less of an income don't get, but I'm assuming that they're asked to pay less than, than, yeah. you're, than you're asked to pay. I'm sure it's prorated based on your salary at some. Mm-hmm. That's where the subsidies come in. Ah, see, there's all kinds of big words I don't know. There, I mean, it's, it's a complex system, but it's better than nothing. <laughs> it's better than nothing. And even though they're not, they're fighting you on how many test strips you need and it's not affordable for you to get a glucose monitor, um, it's still, like you're saying, it's much better than nothing. It's not just better than nothing. It's a million times better than nothing. From a million times better to nothing, then a million times better than the best thing. Let's go talk about some Omnipod tubeless insulin pumping. Come on, people. Get with me here. Ready? Should we sing? Boom. 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 Do, 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 do. I might sing through the whole thing. Myomnipod.com forward slash juice box in case I don't say anything else after this. You know what? Instead of singing through the whole thing, because I'm a terrible singer, let me tell you a story. Absolutely true. Happened an hour ago. I'm editing this episode of the podcast together right now while my family is at the movies. We realized as we were getting ready to go out the door, not we, but them, that Arden's insulin pump was getting ready to expire and need to be changed. Her Omnipod need to be changed. Two of her friends standing in the kitchen, my wife with her jacket on, and I say, hey, Arden's got to change her pump before you go. I am not lying to you when I tell you that four minutes later, Arden was in the car driving away. See, we talk about things all the time. You know, you know what we forget to talk about? People with tubed insulin pumps sit around priming bubbles out of tubing for a while. That does not happen with the Omnipod. Listen, you've heard me talk about it a million times. Just do this one thing. Go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box and get a free demo right now. It's a free, no obligation demo pod. You put in a little bit of information, the next thing you know, the demo pods at your house, you decide if you like it or not. You'll decide if I'm telling you the truth, which I am. Myomnipod.com forward slash juice box. Before we get to Sarah, one last message from Michelle. I love the Affordable Care Act because I'm alive and well because of it. My name is Sarah and I am 31 years old and I've had diabetes since I was 10. 21 years. Yep. Wow. This week. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yep. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Excellent. Good for you. Do you, um, do you use any uh, of the technology, insulin pumps or glucose monitors or anything like that? Yes. I have an Omnipod and a Dexcom currently. And you are currently getting your health care through the Affordable Care Act? Yes, I am. I work for a very small nonprofit organization, and the only way that we could have health insurance through our employer is because of uh, being able to purchase through the marketplace. Okay. Is it, uh, is it financially reasonable 
based on like what you know other people pay through their employers who are maybe more subsidized? I feel like it's pretty typical uh, coverage wise, um, just from all of the other diabetics that I know and have uh, insurance through their employer. Um, it seems to be pretty on par. Um, I, I wish it was better. I've worked for other uh, companies and organizations that had slightly better coverage, and I'm not sure if that's because it wasn't through the marketplace. Um, I know I've paid a lot less for my 90-day supplies of test strips and insulin and whatnot, um, so there's definitely room for improvement. Uh, because I work for such a small organization, um, you know, the, the pay isn't quite where, where I would love it to be. So um, because the, the costs of my 90-day supplies are still so high, it makes it very difficult to build up any kind of savings. Can you tell me what that outlay, that financial outlay is versus if you just did not have health insurance? I can't even imagine. <laughs> um, back uh, in, the, in the recession, um, right about the time when the ACA was really getting off the ground, um, I would, the economy wasn't great. I'd been laid off four different times. Um, and I remember one day just calling every insurance company saying like, Hey, it's just me. What are your individual plans? Like PS, I have type one diabetes and they would quote me these outrageous monthly premiums. They'd say, Oh yeah, this is a, this is a plan that doesn't take HIPAA into consideration. So we're going to start that off at $1,200 a month. And I've heard people say that some plans through the ACA for, for individual coverage is that much now, so I'm not really sure uh, how great it's doing. But I know at the same time, without the provisions in the Affordable Care Act, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have coverage. It's, it's that plain and simple. And so what would that look like for you if you just didn't have coverage? Would you – What would I mean, I guess you'd lose your glucose monitor and your pump? Yeah. Um, I mean, there were times in the last couple of years before the ACA when uh, I was between jobs and I didn't have coverage. They announced the uh, you could stay on your parents' plan until you're 26 mm -hmm. when I turned 26. So kind of missed the boat on that altogether. Um, <laughs> so there were absolutely times when I was without coverage. And the only way I literally survived was because I have a lot of friends with type 1 diabetes. So I was able to kind of uh, borrow supplies here and there and trade and things like that. That's the only way I was able to stay afloat. And if there was no ACA, you know, tomorrow it's repealed and uh, we get letters saying you're cut off. Um, I'd have to do that again. I'd have to keep, um, keep up with my stockpiles and trade and barter and keep things on the down low. And hopefully I would have enough to keep me going. I would absolutely not be able to afford uh, the sensors for my CGM. I can barely afford them now. Um, and, and, you know, eat, eat a lot of low carb meals. So I you know, keep my insulin usage low and stretched as long as I could. Without that technology, do you have an idea of what happens to your A1C? Like, do you know where you were within without it? Oh yeah. It's, it's phenomenal. Having a CGM, you know, it literally saved my life. It saved the lives of my friends on numerous occasions. Um, you know, I'm able to go to sleep with a blood sugar at 90, with a blood sugar at 80 even, and know that, I'm going to be okay and I'm going to be able to wake up in the morning and I'm going to be able to have an awesome A1C as a result. Um, being 31 and being newly married, you know, pregnancy is, is in the cards for the near future. Um, I'm trying to get my A1C as low as I possibly can in preparation for that. And without having that technology, I would have to ride high, you know, just to make sure I'm safe and I'm not willing to give that up at this point. Right. And, and even the, the word safe is sort of a misnomer, right? You're trading... <laughs> You're trading health on the other end of your life for not dropping dead today. Is exactly. You, right. Okay. Ab absolutely. That doesn't seem like much of a barter. Um, it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. not at all. And with the technology, you're not in that situation. Your A1C is lower. You're, you're, you know, you're more comfortable keeping your blood sugar where it needs to be or where you'd hope it, you know, where you want it to be. Um, and and that stuff goes away. And I forget. Geez, it goes away. And not only are you not in this world anymore with the technology and and, and the health where you're, you can be really, you know, happy about it, but you're bartering with, with other people with type one diabetes. So you're, you're yeah. walk me through any one of those exchanges. Cause I don't, that's not something I completely wrap my head around, even though I know it happens. <laughs> so, uh, 
it, it'll start off, you know, personally with, with people that I know in real life from diabetes camps and uh, other networking events. And just kind of say like, hey, I know you're on XYZ pump. I know you're on, uh, you know, XYZ, you use XYZ meter. Uh, I know you're a teenager. Maybe you have really good insurance through your parents. And I know you're probably not checking your blood sugar as often as you should. Do you have like a stockpile of test strips? I could like, you know, get a couple vials. Uh, it's happened that way. Um, there's a, a wealth of uh, connections on Facebook where you can post in search of this, 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 uh, maybe someone out there had their insurance change and they're only covering this type of insulin or this type of you know infusion set or something, or they have a stockpile of whatever you're looking for, um, and that's that's how it happens. That's something. Do you ever have you ever swapped with somebody you just didn't know? Yeah, absolutely. Is that frightening? Not really. Um, I haven't done it with like insulin just because that would be a hard thing to ship and guarantee the integrity of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it got warm in the summertime on the trip over. Um, you know, that, that seems a little sketchy to me, but like test strips or, um, I, I typically get a lot of like Tegaderm and tape and things like that because that's, that's not really detrimental uh, in the shipping process. If somebody was to say to you, there are companies that, you know, will will help you get their supplies more affordably if you can't afford them. Have you ever tried that? I've looked into it. Um, it seemed very difficult a couple of years ago, um, just in the last couple of years with, um, with having pretty decent insurance and, and having the, the funds to, Put up. I haven't looked into those programs recently. Mm-hmm. But you make you would make too much money when you're employed. Even though you're, you said you're at a smaller company where you're not making as much right. as you have in the past, you would still be making too much money to take advantage of that. Then, yeah, it, it depends. You know, each one kind of has different um, eligibility requirements. Mm-hmm. And um, to be honest, it hasn't been worth for me the trade off of spending the time researching those programs. Right. Now, I, I even wonder sometimes just about the people who's you know, pride would get in the way in that situation. And, and I would even understand that, you know, so, uh, you know, and it's funny at the beginning, you were talking, you, you described yourself as a person working for a nonprofit. So you're out in the world trying to do good things for people. It sounds like. Yeah, I hope. Yeah. And, and that doesn't being kind doesn't apparently pay very well. <laughs> no, it does not. <laughs> I think whenever you uh, apply for a, co- a job at a company and they tell you your web, their website ends in dot org, you're, you're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> as far as trying to <laughs> trying to shake out the big dollars from them, and, yeah, yeah, and and so it's just, you know it's just a bigger picture. You're a person who is even in their professional life trying to help other people, and you know you're getting a little bit of goodness back in the way of this Affordable Care Act being you know in the world, and mm-hmm. and now do you feel? I mean, w- when it's being talked about and spoken about in the news like this, can you? Is it a day-to-day anxiety for you? I mean, how does it how does it strike you knowing that it could just go away? Uh, it had been day-to-day for me, maybe since leading up to the election and the days after. And um, you know, I have a political science degree. It's it's always been something I followed closely. And recently, I've just kind of had to have unplugged from a lot of the news and stories that come across. Um, one because. I know it'll kind of trigger that kind of anxiety in me. Um, you know, not not sure what's going to happen with it, but also, you know, the things that come across in your feed. Um, is the source reliable? What kind of spin are they putting on that, you know, two line headline to really grab your attention and get you fired up um, or mislead you? Uh, and and again, I don't. I frankly don't have the energy to look at that thing that pops up and say, is this legitimate? Like do I have a reason to be concerned yet? Um, and I've had to kind of turn a lot of that off and not really pay attention. And uh, as, as crappy as that sounds, kind of wait until, uh, you know, an official decree has been announced <laughs> that it's going to be repealed. And I know that kind of takes me and my, my agency out of the process into uh, letting, you know, letting my senators and representatives know that, hey, I will be affected uh, should this go away. But um, I kind of have a lot of faith in that 
oh man, it sounds terrible that other people are doing it. But uh, you know, personally, again, like just having the energy and, and attention to uh, to invest in that. Uh, it's, it's a trade-off for my own mental health, I think, yeah, to I kind of have to shut it off. <laughs> I don't know that people can appreciate If you're living with a chronic illness, I don't live with one, my daughter does, but I'm mm -hmm. managing one 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So if you're living with a chronic illness, there's already a large part of your mind that is taken up with thoughts and ideas and concerns that most people don't live with day to day. And, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, it goes well, it doesn't go well. You're also trying to... Uh, vacuum your rug and make dinner and go to the grocery store and work yeah. your job and talk to your children. And then in the five free minutes, you have to have the television or the internet telling you, Hey, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, we're going to do something that might kill you. Yeah. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make you really sick or kill you. Right. And so, uh, you, I mean, how do you listen to that at the end of a day? I don't, I don't know how you would do it. I, I think your response is very reasonable. Absolutely. My thanks to Omnipod and Dexcom for sponsoring this episode of the juice box podcast don't forget you can go to myomnipod.com forward slash juice box to find out more about the world's only tubeless insulin pump while you're on the internet you should also go to dexcom.com forward slash juice box and find out more about i'm just gonna say what is my favorite continuous glucose monitor on this the planet earth i also want to thank three great advocates for people with type 1 diabetes and people everywhere mike sarah and michelle Guys, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your stories. You know, I'm just going to take a second here at the end and kind of talk from, I guess, my heart a little bit. I, you know, I've thought the entire time I've been an adult that the government wastes money. It doesn't spend money efficiently. I remember hearing my parents say it. I remember hearing my grandparents say it. And I'm assuming that long before that, Generations and generations of people have been complaining, probably mostly correctly, that the United States government does not do a good job of spending money. We don't allocate well. Uh, we certainly are not frugal. We buy, you know, it's, it's very famously spoken about, million-dollar little parts that probably could have been bought for 50 cents and things like that. Money gets wasted. And it's disgusting. It makes me sick. It makes me sick to think that the taxes that I paid in the entirety of my adult life may go to buy one thing that just sits somewhere and never gets used. But on a human level, I just think that if we're already getting shook down, let's at least let sick people have the dignity of health care. I mean, if we're going to cut something somewhere, I just don't understand that we all can't agree that it should be something something other than the life and the happiness and the health and the well-being of our fellow man. It just doesn't make any sense to me that this is where we try to draw the line of all the things that could be eliminated from the budget, of all the things that don't need to be. How is it that we, we so, so sort of vehemently can be upset about people and their health? Anyway, that is my two cents on this. I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast. And, um, you know, on a personal level, I would love to see the Affordable Care Act bettered. I think it's a great start, and I certainly think it could be made much, much better. But deconstructing it back down to zero and starting over again, that is not the answer. We've got something. It's working. People are insured. Let's make it work better. Let's make it work more efficiently. Let's continue to let it evolve. But let's not just take it away so that a different party can say, hey, we fixed health care. That's just, that's just silly. And it disregards the dignity of every person who needs it. This year, this year insurance companies will no longer be able to drop people's coverage when they get sick. Yeah. Or place. They won't be able to place lifetime limits or restrictive annual limits on the amount of care they can receive. This year, this year, all new insurance plans will be required to offer free preventive care. And this year, young adults will be able to stay on their parents' policies until they are 26 years old. That happens this year. <laughs>